Welcome back to Operator Syndrome. I'm Patrick. This is Steve. Uh, we're here talking about uh, a lot of things, but most of it related to our, our stints in special operations. Uh, where we last left off, uh, I, I left us with a teaser about uh, my, my onboarding into the military and, and Preparation H. So, yeah. so if the folks have been waiting for it, I say we get right into it. Give them what they want. I can't wait. So I think the, the first thing I need to say, and I mentioned this before in, in the last episode last week, uh, was that, uh, you know, I, I, I think I, I, I typified the, the, the millennial experience at the time, right? So I was a suburban kid, suburban DC. Um, I, I, was doing, I was doing JROTC at the time, uh, and I was doing um, the rifle team, like an air rifle team, okay? But I wasn't really playing sports. I played football and soccer my freshman year. And again, I, I had just gone really far off the deep end, like wanting to serve. So my focus was on, was on going into and being a JROTC nerd. Um, and as part of that, I got fat. Okay. In JROTC, you're not really exercising. That's not really a core component of it. Not like if you were on track or playing football or on the swim team, anything like that. Um, I spent most of the time in my head, like visualizing what would be the glories that would come and less of it actually physically preparing myself. So I talked about going into the recruiter. So after I graduated, I went in to see the recruiter, talked to him about what I wanted to do. He was like, yeah, sure, kid. We'll sign you up for a ranger contract. Why not? That gives him a body that goes into the conventional infantry. Um, the first time I went into MEPS was the summer of 2005. Um, again, every day, folks are dying over there. Um, it is not going well at that time. You know, we, we, we began, we, we collectively began to understand that we were in a little bit of a, of a sticky situation, a little bit of a quagmire. I go into MEPS that summer and I'm disqualified because I don't meet the height weight requirements. Oh, right. Cause you'd gained weight. <laughs> yeah. I'd gain weight. Well, I, I default to chunky. That's, huh, that's, yeah. that's partly genetics. Uh, partly because my, my family overall doesn't have like, this is not a family that, that exercises regularly. I try to do a little bit better for my daughter, try to break the cycle of chunkiness. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I try to lift, I try to run to, to at least show my daughter that it's important to attempt it. And this yeah. is nothing against the, the folks who came before me in my family tree, but they just live differently. Okay. Right. So, so, you know, that was a big, you know, that was, I felt pretty defeated. You know, at the time, I had all these visions in my head of what I was going to do and what I was going to be. And I couldn't, I didn't get accepted by the military to be an infantryman in, in 2005 in the middle of a war. Okay. So um, that was a shock. That was a humbling experience. So at, at that point, I, I began to, to prep, to seriously prep to get into the military. I hadn't before. I just thought I'd wing it. I would just send it as the kids say today. Yeah. So that didn't work out and that was humbling. Uh, and, and I started to prepare. I started to run, exercise, all the, all the things that I should have been doing the entire time. But I was still, again, I, I didn't have a, a, a very deep athletic background. So I, I definitely wasn't pushing myself as far as I could have. I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm built pretty broadly. Like mm. I, I'm not a tall guy, but I'm pretty pretty, pretty broad. And so, you know, the military height weight requirements, the calculations yeah. kind of, are kind of a disadvantage to folks with my build. Right. Um, to, in the first place, I was still, I was still fat. That's my fault. But I was also disadvantaged by, by, right. by the way that these, these, these old school calculations were yeah, yeah. for body types. So, um, so I prepped, I ran, I did all that type of stuff. Uh, I remember running down the street with a camelback you know, the Camelbacks, the water source, you have it. Those were like, like around that time they had just come out and I was very military. 
So like I'd put that, I'd put that on and I go running with a water source on my back. That, that's something I would come to hate to have to do whenever I was actually in the military, but I just thought I was cool. I was getting ready. Like people would know this guy's training for the, to be a ranger. So did you ever wear a plastic garbage bag? I might have. Yeah. I, I probably didn't do it too many times, but like, that's like, that's the type of stuff like <laughs> that, that I was doing. Like I, I was doing things from television to get ready. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, so I go back to MEPS and, and uh, I, I barely pass. I, I actually get through it. I get the contract, but it's still close. Actually, no, no, I got to take a quick step back. I got to preparation H is, is why, is why I passed. So the recruiter was like, all right, no, he was like, all right. So you're going in there. Like you need to do everything you can because they were, they were tape testing me the night yeah. before I was going to MEPS the second time. And they're like, dude, you're right on the borderline. You're, you've definitely improved since the last time, but you're on the borderline and, and we can't do this again. So, so my recruiter tells me, he's like, listen, here's what you're going to do <sighs> the night before. Cause I'm, I have to drive up and stay in a hotel and then go to MEPS. He's like the night before I want you to, I want you to go buy something called preparation H preparation H is for, um, uh, hemorrhoids yeah okay and I, I guess the way conceptually the way it works is that it like it uses heat or whatever to to constrict to shrink constrict and shrink um inflammation i know so he's like wrong. he's like i want you to get a big tube of preparation h and the night before i want you to cover your body in it and get shrink wrap and then tie yourself up and suck it in and then sleep like that and then the next morning you're going to be good to go and like i fail steve I, 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 I failed going to map. Think of like, think about this cloud hanging up. I wanted to get into the war. I would do anything. Sure. So I go to maps the night before and believe it or not, my roommate was a prior ranger from the, from the ranger battalions who had gotten out. He'd gotten out in like 2000. He did his four years, gotten out. He'd, he talked to me about like training trips he'd done in the Philippines, working with the SEALs, all kinds of stuff he had done. But he had gotten out in 2000, and then the, the war kicked off, and now he was trying to come back in. So I was listening to his stories. I didn't tell him that I was trying to be a ranger. I was focused on what I had to do. So that night, I go into the, I go into the bathroom, lather my torso with preparation H, <laughs> and then I do the shrink wrap. And I have the, the worst night of sleep I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and imagine why. <laughs> so I got preparation and it felt warm. It didn't hurt. Oh, yeah. It didn't hurt. It just felt warm. And yeah. like all I could think of was and you're, you're like you're at you're in a two person hotel room. And I'm like with this ranger guy. And I was like, I don't want to embarrass myself. If I took a deep breath in, you could hear the crinkle crinkle of the of the saran wrap. So man, what's going on over there? <laughs> and then the smell. Have you ever smelled preparation? There's no way this this guy must have thought, who the who the hell is in? Who the hell is in this bed next to me? Some kind That's of psycho. Ryan. <laughs> it's funny. I can't imagine. So then I don't sleep because I can't sleep. I'm a nervous, but B, I, I smell like preparation. The smell and the and the saran wrap are, are on my torso are to me. So, but that's the dedication. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. kids who are listening, that's what it takes. So, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I go in and everything goes fine. I get the contract. That's that 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 that's the medicine. Wow. Do you um? We'll 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 pause there for me. Do you have any um? Anything, anything exciting happen at MEPS or with oh, the recruiter? Uh, at MEPS, not really, but I just remember some of the very uncomfortable things they made you do uh, physically to prove that your uh, body was put together properly enough to go and serve. Like, right. like I had a... Okay, I've had a lifelong injury on my right knee. I got hit hard in football. I was running back and got tackled. I was a sophomore, and the senior varsity dude, just linebacker, just about tore my leg off. Wow. And uh, it's given me trouble ever since, man. When I was in hell, we get flared up. And even now, I went out and running recently, and and then in Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a whole nother story. It gets tweaked all the time. And so we're, you know, 
at MEPS, we had to do the old walk on our knees. Remember that? The duck, on, walk. the duck, duck walk. walk on our knees. And I mean, it was, I was about to, it was excruciating, man, because it was right on the patella of my knee. I'm like, this, why are they making us do this? You're probably ruining more knees than you're helping. But anyway, and then the old um, bend over and spread them wide. You know, that was another one that, and I, I had the, I had the, the, this is just my luck in life. I had the tallest physician do that one with these enormous hands. <laughs> I, it was like almost, I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? They, they hand know. pick them <laughs> for that yeah. job. I, I'm, 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 I'm certain. <clears throat> but uh, not, not really nothing on the level of your story with preparation age, man. I, I, I just knew when you said preparation H, I was just going to be lacking in that department. I, I did some recruiter. The only two recruiter stories I had were with a Marine recruiter. I got into an argument with him over because I wanted to do something like force recon. Right. And he was trying to tell me that the highest calling in life was to be a Marine infantryman. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm saying, no, no. Uh, I've seen, I've seen full metal jacket. I don't want to be private pile. You know, I, that, that's not my calling. I'm telling you right now. And he goes, Oh, it's great. I said, well, what did you do in the Marine Corps? He said, well, I worked on helicopters. And I'm like, well, I know I knew more about infantry recon. I probably knew more about just about everything in special operations and, and e even infantry than this guy did. And he was the recruiter trying to, trying to tell me, but mm -hmm. that's such a common thing there. They've got quotas and they've, they and they've got, they've got pressures because in the military, for those of you who may not know, or you may already know this, but there's, there's all these billets they need to fill for certain slots or certain MOS military occupational specialties, or in the Navy, we call them ratings ace you go to an a school and get a rating as this or that so uh, the only funny i mean i don't know, it, like nothing's going to compare to that preparation age you know? <laughs> i'm not going to give it up right now but uh <laughs> they you did have to when i when i went to finally the navy recruiter and he he was all on board with the die fair because they were trying to push that at that point because they mm -hmm. wanted to get more seals um the the attrition rates are just really high in, in, in seal boot camp. So, um, so he said, uh, well here, and he shows me a list you had to pick. Now that's back in the day today, they, they have made a special operator rating. So you could be a seal, a SWIC, a special boat unit guy, like an EOD. They fall into this family of, uh, it always should have been like that, but it never was. And here's why you had to pick, uh, do you want to be a boatswain's mate? which means you swab decks and chip paint on a ship, or do you want to be a quartermaster? And a quartermaster was a guy who knew how to read charts in the army. It's like a supply person, but in the Navy, it's a guy who can navigate basically and read charts and compasses and all that. But nowadays they have GPS um, or, and, and so they're, you know, machinist mate, gunners mate, you know, all these different, all these different, um, different ratings so he said here pick one of these you got to pick one because or you can't go to uh you can't go to uh you've got to pick one in order to go there after boot camp navy boot camp a school then we'll send you to buds oh my gosh it sounds like a lot of hassle so i'm looking on this list and i'm like what are all these what's a quartermaster what's this he goes well they do this kind of thing and that kind of thing and um so i i come to one called pr parachute rigger it's technically called air crew survival equipment, but PR parachute rigger for short. And the only thing the re, I picked it because the ra the rating badge that goes on your uniform had like parachute wings on it and it looked like jump wings. So I'm like, well, I want to, I want that on my uniform. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. So that, that just you're clueless, you know, Yeah. Well, little did I know. So what you're trained to do for one, it's a, it's a pretty long school, like, some of these schools are two weeks and then you're off and running. This was three months. <laughs> this school was three months of me doing stuff that I didn't want to do. I just wanted to get to SEAL training, take off. So what you do as an air crew survival equipment is work on ejection seats on, on Navy 
fighters and stuff or any any bird really that's on an aircraft carrier mm -hmm. and um so you have to learn to pack parachutes so that that was that did apply because i was a parachute rigger for my platoon every platoon had to have a parachute rigger we had all these subspecialties in a seal platoon you know outboard motor guy weapons guy scuba dude um, in addition to the jobs we did like point man 60 gunner whatever um so i did learn some stuff about parachutes and i learned to sew oh yes i learned to use a sewing machine and so that really paid dividends because guys always wanted their gear modified back in the day mm -hmm. so i was the rigger i had access to these really heavy duty mach uh, heavy duty sewing machines so i could sew thick webbing make riggers belts uh, you name it i could make i could sew it and make it it really came in handy when i went to sniper school because i could sew myself and my buddies uh, my partner who went with me uh, i could sew our ghillie suits which we had to custom build really so it, it did pay off a little bit but it took forever and um man i it, it was the worst rate in the navy to get promoted because <clears throat> you could be an awesome seal but you have to compete against fleet parachute riggers to make rank. You're not right. competing as a SEAL, which really sucked because after A school, I never saw an ejection seat. I never saw half that equipment that they do. And they, they're doing it on a daily basis. So they're very knowledgeable about it. I hadn't seen anything, didn't know anything about what I was being tested on. It just looked like gibberish to me. I'm like, God, just guessing, man, just trying to form cool patterns of bubbles on these exams. Mm -hmm. And so I, I never, I never mm -hmm. made it. They, they, they would promote like two people to E5 in the entire pair Navy in, of parachute riggers in a cycle. And here's me down at the bottom, not knowing what they're doing. So I got meritoriously promoted twice. Um, but I, that had to be by my commanding officer. So I, I made E5 before I got out, but, um, it was the the cluelessness i don't I, yeah the the recruiter knew a little bit about those ratings but not enough to really be helpful to me he should have just said be a boatswain's mate or a quartermaster because those are the fastest they they, re, they promote the most people in those rates plus it's only two weeks and you're off the buds but mm -hmm. you know i'm wiser now though no, they don't even have that system anymore so so where'd you go to Boot camp, basic training. What is the Navy? Boot called? camp, Orlando, Florida. Back when it's no longer there, um, and the cool thing about that was that's where the female sailors went. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, target rich environment for us down there. It, what if you had a chance to go that direction? <laughs> but, you know, right. but it was uh, yeah, it was um, it was yeah. Back then there were three. There was uh, the main one is it is now the only one in Great Lakes up in Chicago. And then um, there was one on the wet on the West Coast in San Diego and then in Florida. But those other two are gone and it's now just Great Lakes. So what was what was boot camp like? What do you remember about it? A joke. Right. It was a joke. So I had been PT and hard, hard, hard to get ready for the SEAL. Uh, he had had to pass this thing three times one time to get the contract uh, so i had to go it, it, have a recruiter actually give me this test or somebody who knew how to give the test um it was a run a swim a, uh pull-ups push-ups and sit-ups but it was one after another and any one of them was kind of easy for an athlete i mean i was in really good shape i was a fast runner um always good at pull-ups push-ups sit-ups all that i had it down swimming was my worst uh category and i actually hired a swim coach to teach me the breaststroke and the side stroke because i knew those were the two um the, they're they're efficient strokes and they're also you can swim a long way with those strokes and you know you don't want to be doing butterfly you know for five miles but you know but uh so I, he taught me how to do the strokes properly and i practice and practice i like obsessed over getting in really good shape so when i got to boot camp it was such a joke man navy boot camp now it's different in the army and the marines but it was just like so many out of shape guys i couldn't believe it and so it, we got so little pt 
I was getting in worse shape at boot camp. I hear that. I, I hear that it, as a common thing for, for Navy folks interested in, oh, in the SEALs. It was awful. In fact, we, the times we would get hammered, if you could call it that, our company command, or basically the, the drill instructor, would drop us down. And we, I, I was smiling one time when we got dropped down because I was so glad to be doing some exercise and cranking out some push-ups. And he comes walking by and he's like, why are you smiling? And I was like, because I need more PT. And he goes, what the hell are you talking about? And I was like, well, I'm going into the, I'm, I'm trying out to, to go to Bud's to be a SEAL. And he goes, so you're one of those crazy mofos. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. And he goes, Gee. so from then on, he looked at me like, you're nuts but but he he made me the our company pt leader because i liked it so much and the other guy was doing a lousy job anyway so that was awesome because i could push us push us harder i could lead the runs and um i wasn't exactly the most popular person in the company because there were these are a lot of guys that were just nerds that just wanted to sit at a desk or do some job that was kind of to me and to me it was lame um but uh but i got to also do remedial pt for the guys who couldn't meet the minimum standards and there were a couple there was this one guy, poor kid man he could barely run five steps in a row he was he was overweight i don't know how he got in but preparation and, h is my guess yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect yeah yeah i guess uh anyway oh that poor guy I'll never forget his name was Ramos, his last name. And he, he used to hate to see me coming because I was like, man, I got to help. You got to help. You got to pass this test. So we would get special permission to go to the parade ground and run. And I would just run, 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 run. And while he was, you know, walking along. And, and so that was cool. But um, man, other than that, it was it was kind of a joke. Um, I don't know. Navy boot camp's got to be the lamest. And you got to wear these stupid uniforms that make you feel like a complete dork. I mean, boondockers and denim shirts and white Navy sailor hats. I just felt humiliated. It's like, man. And then God help you if you have to wear the birth control glasses with all of that. You just look like a complete nerd. But um, yeah, I, I also had to wear the birth control glasses, the, BC, <laughs> the BCGs. See, this is this is a great comparison, a study in, in contrasting uh, uh, events. Um, yeah. So I, I'm guessing when graduation came around, you, you weren't filled with the the the, the Navy pride. Would would, would, you, <laughs> would would you would you would you say that? Would you say that? I mean, you were disappointed, and and um, you, you just saw it as okay, something time, now time to get serious, basically, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very underwhelming. I was just like, time to get the heck out of here and go on and do something meaningful. But I still had to, I had a school, three months of a school to look forward to, which I was just like, can't you just send me to buzz and get all this over with? But where, where was that? Where, where did you do a school? Lakehurst, New Jersey, where the Hindenburg crashed. Nice. Yeah. It, it was an old air base, a Naval air base. Um, and it still is, I guess. But they had these humongous hangars. I never forget it. The biggest hangars I've ever seen in my life out in the middle of, uh, but it was pretty cool because we were, we were close to um, Seaside Heights, New Jersey, the Jersey Shore. And that was a fun place to get away on weekends and stuff and see concerts. Bon Jovi was big back then. And of course. Yeah, we could, we could just, we, uh, we, we didn't party that hard because I was just always, any spare minute I had off, I was running with, in the sand, with boots on or swimming or drown proofing. <clears throat> Another good thing that came out of my A school is I met a guy like you kind of met that guy at MEPS and he had quit twice. <laughs> he, he got two shots at Bud's and he had quit both times in Hell Week. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to mine this guy for every factoid I can figure out. And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing you better be ready to do. And that's drown proofing. And I was like, what, what's that? It's where they tie your feet together and your hands behind your back. And you have to swim like 300 yards without drowning. Um, and it's hard. It is really hard if, you, if you've if never done it before, if you've never practiced. Then you have to, after you swim that length, you have to 
go down, you have to bob in the deep end. And it's like a 10 or 12 foot training tank. It's not just like a short deep end. It's, it's pretty deep, deep end. Got to go all the way down, all the way up. Got to do that for like five minutes. And then they throw a mask on the bottom of the pool. You have to, oh, that's the hardest part. <clears throat> you got to swim down there tied up. You got to like dolphin kick your way down, grab the mask with your mouth, bring it up and set it on the side of the pool. And um, I'm telling you, I him telling me about that. So I went to the base pool at Lakehurst, New Jersey. I would tie my feet together. I would make sure there was a lifeguard available. Good. And I would, I would tell him, hey, yeah, and don't hurt anybody. Yeah, don't don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> And uh, I would I would just hold my hands together behind my back like this. I wouldn't tie my hands because I wanted to, in case, be able to at least use my hands. But uh, I got to where, <laughs> kid you not, I could swim a mile tied up. I would swim a mile. I don't know how many got off a laps back and forth, but I was like, if I can swim a mile, I think I got this. And uh, I did. So you were able to stay very disciplined in, in, boot, in boot camp to do to do your best given the the constraints and mm -hmm. and uh, i know as is typical in a school advanced train advanced individual training in the army you probably are given more freedoms you you could have slacked off the opportunity was there did you have folks in boot camp in a school there had to have been at least one other person who wanted to go to buds as well right were there other folks did you did you see did yeah. you see folks also maintain that discipline did i'm sure you saw maybe both folks that maintained it and folks that 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 got lazy yeah boot camp there were about five people that took the seal that passed the seal uh preparatory uh, test um i was the only one out of the five that ever got to buds the rest of them because i kept in touch with the guys and that none of them even made it to buds i don't know what happened they went different directions I don't think they were near. I, I know for a fact they were not nearly as serious about it as I was because I was just, I knew everything at that point. I'd read everything there was to read mm -hmm. available, which wasn't a whole lot back then, honestly. And um, finding out, but at A school, I met one of my life, lifelong best friends, still still in touch with him, Kevin. He, be, he, be, he, he went to Dev Group and he was a master chief, uh, retired from Dev Group as a master chief. Um, and I got to work with Kev again uh, when I went to Dev Group as a chaplain. I did not go to Dev Group as an operator. Um, I got orders to Green Team when I was still a shooter, a SEAL, but it was right, it was 93, it was right at the end of my enlistment. And at that point I decided I was gonna go a different direction and go to college. Um, it was the hardest decision I ever made, man. It just still tortures me. But anyway, Kevin uh, and I became really good buds except one night when I, I came in, we were roommates at, at, in a school and uh, I got in at some God awful hour, like two in the morning, man, got catch this bus from like a Fort Dix and army base all the way over to Lakehurst. And I mean, I'm like, it, it felt like I was in the twilight zone, man. I'm like clueless walking around. Does anybody know where? No. What are you doing? Shut up. I'm like, ah, man, you walking around my stupid hat with my, with my sea bag feeling like a complete loser and I, I finally find my room after what seemed like an hour of, of walking around this stupid building and I'm like got a key and I'm you know clunking around it's pitch dark and I'm like where's my bed and this Kev, Kev wakes up he said what what the hell's going on man and I'm like I, I don't know I'm, I'm your I'm, I'm a roommate and this is my room now and he goes well shut the hell up you're making a noise I can't sleep I'm like trying man I'm, give me a break anyway we had a laugh about it later and uh and uh became really good friends and we we were in the we started in the same buds class he had an injury got rolled i had an incident which we'll talk about now that without it could be a whole episode uh and i got rolled that was not my proudest moment um uh and so we ended up graduating from two different classes but um we met back up downrange in the gulf war <clears throat> Um, anyone who goes straight through any of the courses doesn't really get the full experience. And for anyone that hears that, I want you to know that if you yeah. get rolled somewhere for something, that doesn't yeah. count, basically. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so for me, uh, basic training, 
uh, again, uh, going down to Fort Benning, home of the infantry, uh, down in Georgia. Um, got down there. It was, I, I guess it was pretty much what I thought it would be. I, I don't think I would say I was, I was disappointed. You know, for me, I was coming from the opposite end of the spectrum physically. So I was chunky. Uh, I, I was somewhat athletic. You know, there are those folks who, who carry a bit of weight, but they can seem to move. I, I think I, I probably fall underneath that category. And, you know, over the course of basic training. So basic training in the Army, the standard basic training, I think is like, oh, man, is it like nine weeks, I think? for i think that's just basic training and then for everybody and then you go off to your advanced individual training which would be like the navy's a school for infantrymen though um, they just put it together so it's 14 weeks it's basically 14 weeks of of basic training even though part of it's considered ait um i thought it measured up i i thought it was kind of what i had expected um i shed a bunch of the weight yeah. It just kind of came off in that environment. It's hot. You're mm. walking around, you're uncomfortable, you know, you're not eating all the good stuff that mom makes. So like the, the weight came off easily. Um, I think physically, I think I did, I did progress. I think I, I came out better um, than, than I, as I had gone in. And I think I, I think they did a good job of brainwashing me into thinking that I was something an infantryman i was something special so um not not too many create you know so when i went you're talking about the folks that trained you up so the 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 drill sergeants that i had these were guys who were you know these were e6s e7s who were from the the previous four years right so they were they were fresh off they were Mm -hmm. fresh off some some harrowing deployments and wow. i think it showed uh, i i think you could i think even back then we recognized that some of these guys were kind of off you mm-hmm. know I, I remember one one guy so the two i remember the most one was from the 82nd 82nd airborne division he was a paratrooper um and another guy was from the first infantry division and he he would have been he would have participated in in uh what went on in uh fallujah and ramadi and and all that stuff okay um and i went in late 2005 is when i started so that was like the year prior and then this guy is my my drill sorry and again i think psychologically i think we could see that that whatever he had been through affected him Mm. um i don't have it too many i'm trying to think of any basic training stories um I, I stayed pretty much, I stayed the gray man. That's, yeah. that's kind of my, my niche. Um, that's where I do well. Um, uh, at the very end, you know, at the very end, I remember we had my room, my, my bunk mate, the kid in the bunk. I was a bottom bunk. He was up, up top. Um, I remember he got caught smoking weed. So for whatever reason, we had holdovers in our basic training like bay they were like two of them they slept at the end they didn't do anything with us they just slept in there they were holdovers for being you know dirtbags (laughs) and my my bunk mate was associating with them and uh instead of doing the pugil sticks which is like you know a rite of passage we were all piss tested that day sat out in, in an open field just waiting to get piss tested so that's a that's about it. I can't think of anything right now. I can't think of anything super interesting from basic training. Um, and then I'd go on to to jump school. Yeah, jump school would be next. And I assume, well, no, you'd go to, to buds next. Yeah. So I think in the next one. Well, so why don't we? We're at at about that time. So why don't you tease what we're gonna have serve up? And then uh, we'll we'll close it out. Right. So next uh, time we we talk, um, we're going to be talking about a kind of uh, a, a book, a particular book that's just come out, and maybe tangentially a couple of others. The main one that's out that I'm I'm really told Patrick I'm I can't put it down because I know a number of the people in this book 
personally. I've worked with him. Um, it's called, it's by Matthew Cole, who's a journalist, um, and he's had some distinctions in uh, his, his publications in journalism. Um, Matthew Cole, and it's called Cole, Code of Country, the tragedy, Code Over Country, sorry, the tragedy and corruption of SEAL Team 6. So um, I, I'm really concerned. I knew some of what he's talking about. I actually rubbed shoulders with some of the early stuff he talks about in the early development of SEAL Team 6. Um, I, I don't know first person some of this stuff, but it fits with what I have been able to piece together through friends of mine who I trust who are operators both at um, at this unit and um, and actually a little bit of my time at the unit as a chaplain believe it or not one of the well not believe it or not but, it, but one of the things I did as a chaplain was counseling uh, guys and um, there were bones come flying out of that closet which are I, I they're, they're totally confidential but I am just saying the big picture was I could tell there is a lot of stress. There is a lot of angst and stuff going on. The other, the other book I just got is called Ta A Tactical Ethic, Moral Conduct in the Insurgent Battle Space. We're getting into the area and what we'll talk about is ethics and why they matter and when they get compromised, how things go off the rails. And this book that I don't think we, we may, may or may not touch on called Alpha, the uh, Eddie Gallagher and the War of the, for the Soul of the Navy SEALs. So you can tell in these subtitles, there's something going on in the SEAL teams. And um, I have to say, it, it breaks my heart. I did not know the extent of it. Um, I, I served in a relatively less complex time, honestly. The lines for me were a lot clearer. Um, because when you start dealing with really bad actors and you see buddies treated horribly by bad actors on the other side of the fence the the terrorists and al-qaeda and 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 people who do what we would consider to be inhumane war crimes mutilating corpses and stuff like that the temptation is to go well two can play at that game and um the question i'll leave you with is what separates the good guys from the bad guys what, what, what makes us good and them bad if if in fact they are, if you want to draw those ni nice, neat lines, but, and then they're, they're not always that neat, but I'm just saying, <clears throat> that's a fundamental question that you, it really is important to, to address. So we're going to get into that next time. Hopefully. Another good cliffhanger. So that's going to be all for this one. We'll catch you all next time. Thank you. Thanks.